So you should be on the more than we can afford cost of mandatory minimum sentencing PowerPoint. Historically, judges have had broad discretion to determine a fit sentence for criminal offenders. Mandatory minimum sentences encroach on that broad discretion as Parliament sets a floor sentence below which the judge cannot go. While minimum sentences have always been around, they were very much an exception to the broad judicial discretion in sentencing. And in the past 15 years or so, the number of offenses with a minimum sentence has more than doubled. There are now over 50 offenses with a mandatory minimum sentence, ranging from murder and firearms offenses uh, to bookmaking and certain types of fraud offenses, to with the enactment of Bill C-10 in 2012, the mandatory minimum sentences for nonviolent drug offenses. So we have, um, in a very short period of time, had an exponential growth in the number of mandatory minimum sentences that now apply in Canada, um, and the numbers are only going to grow. Um, the government is continuing to introduce new legislation that features mandatory minimums, such as the Tackling Contraband Tobacco Act, which has um, minimum jail times in it for second, third, and subsequent convictions of um, contraband tobacco smuggling. And they go up to two years less a day for, um, more for a, a fourth or subsequent offense. Um, which, which makes us now second only to the United States in the total number and types of offenses that we have with minimums. Um, and unlike the situation in similar common law jurisdictions, we don't have, um, our, the mandatory minimums in Canada are, are definitely mandatory, um, meaning judges don't have any residual discretion to sentence the minimum if they believe that it would be the appropriate sentence in all the circumstances. So, so other countries have um, some sort of a safety valve provision, provision or an exception provision, which allows judges to have discretion to sentence below a minimum if in all the facts and circumstances they believe that would be the proportionate and just uh, thing to do. In Canada, we have no such safety valve. So unless a judge, um, can find that the mandatory minimum sentence will be unconstitutional, he or she must apply at least that mandatory floor. Um, proponents of mandatory minimums typically argue that they work to deter crime, that they're certain, transparent, and fair. However, none of these justifications is borne out in the evidence. First of all, mandatory minimum sentences are not effective. Uh, they don't deter or reduce criminal activity. There's no demonstrated evidence that, that they do. Um, it may seem logical at first glance. It may seem sort of how it, how, what would make sense would be that if you increase punishment, then you're going to reduce crime. But that's a flawed understanding of the socioeconomic variables the determinants and the risk factors of criminal behavior. In fact, what we do know from the evidence is that long periods of incarceration will increase recidivism and increase the likelihood of individuals reoffending and going on to reoffend for more serious offenses. Um, what happens when we put our limited and scarce resources into tough on crime measures like mandatory minimum sentencing, we're not only wasting our money because we know that they don't work, they don't deter um, future crime, but we're also diverting resources from other approaches and interventions that are proven to work at preventing and reducing crime. So it's it's costly in 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 many senses. Um, you know, first of all, it's a lot of money we're spending on something that's just not been shown to work. But what that means is we now have less 
to spend on things that do work and would actually be preventative measures that could be interventions at the front end um, before crime happens. Um, so that it's sort of a two-pronged problem there and that's why while it may seem logical that they would work, they, they definitely don't. Another rationale that is um, often advanced in favor of mandatory minimum sentences is that they are seen to be transparent and certain. Um, however, they're neither of those things. When judges are limited in their ability to determine what the fitness is going to be, that means that decisions by other actors in the criminal justice system become increasingly more significant. Um, so discretion being removed from judges in at where there's a minimum floor um, basically means that it's shifting that discretion or the significance of that discretion to crown prosecutors and their decision making. Um, when the decisions about what to charge or how to proceed, I mean, those are always significant decisions in our criminal justice system, no doubt. Um, but they become even more so significant when there's a mandatory minimum sentence at play. Um, we've seen in evidence from the United States that the significance of plea bargaining becomes uh, is, is very important to understand in the context of a mandatory minimum. So in, in much of the studies that have been done there, we've seen that people are likely to be induced into pleading guilty to a lesser charge to avoid a mandatory minimum. So where they know that if they take a chance and to trial on a particular criminal offense, they will face at least that minimum. So they're more likely to be induced into accepting a guilty plea regardless of their ultimate, you know, question of their guilt or non-guilt. Um, so really, uh, there's a real potential for miscarriages of justice to take place. And another point about this, this transparency and certainty um, is that, you know, where judges exercise their sentencing discretion in open court and, and their decisions are reviewable on appeal, Prosecutorial decisions, these are decisions that effectively will tie the judge's hands in setting the sentence. They're nearly impossible to review. Um, prosecutors' conduct has to reach a very high standard of abuse of process before it can be um, addressed if, it, if it's, uh, you know, a decision that is then challenged um, by an individual. So, you know, in, on the one hand, we've got people saying, well, no, if you've got a mandatory minimum, you can, you see what it is, that's transparency. However, in how that's implemented, it's very much not transparent and very much not consistent. Um, the final point I'm going to make on this myth busting before I turn it over to Adrian is, um, is to talk a little bit about the perception that somehow um, mandatory minimums are fair because they are facially neutral. They apply in the same way to everybody. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because Adrian's going to cover it in quite a bit of detail. But you know, I think it's important to note um, in this part that se sentencing is is an individualized process, and the fundamental principle of which is proportionality. Um, Adrian's going to to talk us a bit through a bit more through the principles of sentencing, but but basically what it would mean for a sentence to be proportionate is that it fit the crime, and so judges need to know the circumstances not only of the offense but of the offender to have that context to determine what would be the proportionate, proper, appropriate sentence, and so where you have a perception that, well, everybody's treated this way, as Adrienne will go on to explain in her presentation, that's very much not so um, where mandatory minimum sentencing is concerned. So I'm going to take a pause there and turn it over to Adrienne.
Hi, everybody. My name is Adrienne Smith, and I'm the Health and Drug Policy Staff Lawyer for the Pivot Legal Society. You have a small chat window in the bottom of your screen. If people could just chime in and let me know if you can hear me. Fantastic. Thank you. Oops. Close your eyes, everybody. <laughs> All right. Mandatory minimum sentences are bad public policy for everyone. And uh, this is a, a photograph of the Fraser Regional Correction Center. Um, they're bad public policy for everyone because they don't fit with established principles of sentencing in Canadian law. The slide that you're looking at is some uh, incredibly small type, which just sets out not only the governing uh, sentencing principle, as Raji mentioned, which is that uh, sentences must be proportional, uh, but some other considerations that are important cornerstones of how sentencing works in Canada. So for a sentence to be proportional, it means that the punishment you receive is proportional to the amount of moral blameworthiness that you have, uh, which means a person who steals bread because they're a member of a bakery cartel gets a harsher sentence than someone who steals bread because their family is starving. Uh, but it also means that there's some relationship between the sentence that one offender in a particular set of circumstances gets with other offenders in similar circumstances around the same time, so that there's some consistency. So in this way, Canadian sentences are tailored, but they're also consistent. Uh, but beyond that, there's a number of other principles, and I would invite you to go to section 718.2 of the criminal code if you're a legal type and you're interested in this, because this sets out a number number of other principles like rehabilitation, um, not just deterrence, which is one of the principles that the Conservative government has focused on. But there's a suite of them, and judges are supposed to consider all of them. Um, what uh, Pivot and the BCCLA's position is on uh, mandatory minimum sentences is not just that they're bad public policy for everyone, but that for members of the most marginalized communities in Canada, they can amount to cruel and unusual punishment. And this is particularly true for women, for Aboriginal people, and for people who find themselves before the court as a result of their addiction. So this is section 12 of the charter that's on your screen right now. And uh, for, uh, what section 12 says is that everyone has the right not to be subjected to any cruel and unusual treatment or punishment. And the way the courts have interpreted this means that you can't be tortured, you can't be held under uh, particularly onerous conditions. Um, another one of the sentencing principles that uh, we just saw said that the least effective means of punishment must be imposed, which means if I will uh, benefit from a community sentence order for a crime that I'm sentenced to, or if I don't need to go to jail, uh, a judge who's imposing a sentence on me must consider those first. And a failure to do that can push a sentence into the cruel and unusual territory that we're talking about. So for these three groups, um, the first one is women. And uh, we know empirically that uh, jail sentences are much more onerous for female offenders than for others. Uh, and we uh, we know that women play an important social role in communities that sometimes lawmakers are not aware of. So in female-headed households, women play a disproportionately greater role in parenting if they're the only parent. But they're also often involved in uh, particularly vulnerable communities for holding several families together. And removing that one woman from her place in the community can have a ripple effect and repercussions in several families especially if she's the full or part-time caregiver of uh, several children from several different families. And she also is likely to play a role in some kind of elder support. And all of those people who are dependent on that woman will be impacted by a uh, mandatory jail sentence. And that's why women uh, very frequently, particularly for drug charges, until the law changed in 2012, would be sentenced to uh, uh, punishments that happened in the community and they could serve them near home. Um, house arrest would be common and then you could still have um, custody of your children. What happens when women are sent to jail and their sole caregivers is that they're separated from their children 
the BC CLA's report shows that 20,000 Canadian children are separated from their mothers um, by jail terms in Canada every year. The figures in other developed nations are similar and it's atrocious. A recent uh, BC Supreme Court case called Inglis, which challenged uh, the cancellation of a mother baby program that allowed a women who were sentenced uh, to jail terms who were pregnant to stay with their babies. Uh, this program was cancelled. A group of affected female prisoners brought a challenge to the court. And what the found was that uh, people have a constitutional right to stay with their children. And uh, so that case was decided under Section 7 of the Charter, which is the right to life. But uh, there's also a Section 12 aspect to uh, removing you from your children. Um, for Aboriginal offenders, uh, it's also a problem. Uh, this is a, an inmate at um, Manitoba's Stony Mountain Penitentiary. Uh, this image came from an article that ran in the Star, uh, the Toronto Star, uh, and that article uh, showed some statistics. And what we know from the BCCLA's report and from other scholarly work is that uh, while Aboriginal people make up of, uh, about 4% of the Canadian population, uh, their rates of incarceration are staggering. Federally sentenced um, inmates are uh, about 23% Aboriginal. It's even worse for female offenders. Federally sentenced women tend to be about a third of all offender populations. And uh, that's a problem. We know that Aboriginal people are imprisoned at a rate of uh, 910 to 100,000, which is a, a staggering figure. And um, the rates of incarceration are rising. This is a problem that the federal government knows about. And one of the provisions in the criminal code uh, clearly sets out for judges that separate sentencing provisions are appropriate for Aboriginal people and must be considered. Uh, and these were um, reinforced by two important Supreme Court of Canada decisions, one called GLADU that said you need to consider uh, an offender's Aboriginal background and consider uh, any uh, penalty short of jail if it's appropriate. And uh, several years later in 2012, another decision called Ippoli, which said Canadian judges have not paid enough attention to what the Supreme Court said in Gladu and at section 718.2e of the criminal code which says special sentencing provisions apply to Aboriginal people must be considered. Uh, but the effect of a mandatory minimum sentence means that a judge is not allowed to apply this provision and that it cannot consider the Aboriginal heritage of an offender and the impact that might have. And uh, that raises another interesting constitutional problem which affects Aboriginal people disproportionately. Um, the third group of users I'd like to talk about are uh, people who come before the court as a result of their addiction. And when the Conservative government brought in mandatory minimum sentences, they were very public about how this would have a deterrent effect on uh, crime. And that if people knew how long that they were going to jail for, they would choose to behave differently. And this supposes that before a person engages in an activity which is uh, criminalized, they do this cost-benefit analysis. And they say, well, if I do this thing, I'll go to jail for that amount of time, so I'd better not engage in that conduct. Um, what Pivot discovered in a report that you've all received by email uh, that we released last year was that for crimes of desperation that come from addiction or from profound poverty, this cost-benefit analysis just doesn't happen and engaging in activities which have been criminalized are just a regular part of life. Uh, we also know that um, people who come before the court, particularly as a result of profound addiction, don't tend to have their eye on uh, uh, the workings of parliament and may not be aware that there is a mandatory minimum. And they may not know what other people are being sentenced to. And this myth that there's a deterrent effect for crime, as Raji's touched on, is just absolutely illusory. Um, another important thing to remember about the mandatory minimum regime is that uh, not only does it prevent people from having a community sentence order, which we talked about with respect to female offenders, uh, it says you must go to jail, and you must go to jail for a fixed amount of time. And when we look at statistics around prison programming, we know that only about 25% of all offenders are engaged in any kind of program whatsoever. 
which shows that by sending people to jail without any rehabilitative programming, the Conservative government has really turned its back on other sentencing provisions beyond deterrence, like rehabilitation and uh, reintegration into society is certainly not foremost in the mind of a government that makes this kind of policy. Um, and there's also a lack of investment in front pre-crime prevention measures like housing and health care and community supports for families and for struggling with their addictions. Um, and I'd like to touch on this, this final point that and Raji touched really well, which is that moving discretion away from judges and saying, here's a grid you must apply, These are here's a table of sentences for a set of crimes. What happens is this kind of gray market of justice when Crown prosecutors and defense attorneys enter into deals that they would not normally do if there hadn't been a mandatory minimum. And most of the decisions about what's going to happen to people who are convicted of crimes um, goes into this gray area plea bargain. And we know Crown decisions are not reviewable. They can't be appealed. And the solution for this, of course, is to let judges who are expert frontline justice workers who've seen all the evidence uh, and who consider the conditions of the offender, uh, the conditions of the offense, and who know what other offenders for similar, who are similarly situated are getting to do their job and to come up with fair sentences and to make punishments that fit the crime rather than just imposing a one-size-fits-all model, which is hardest on the most vulnerable Canadians. So we're going to go back to Raji for a bit. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Um, so I'm going to just walk us through a little bit of an other findings that are reported on in the BCCLA's report. Um, Adrian talked a little bit about the cost benefit analysis, uh, which you know uh, she very rightly pointed out that th the studies on whether mandatory minimums do deter um, look at well, do people even engage in this kind of thinking before they're, um, while they're considering, if, if you can even call it that, whether to engage in something that's been criminalized? And, and very much so, the evidence is no, that this sort of um, in, engaging in this kind of analysis is not happening, particularly where, as Adrian said, we're talking about crimes of desperation. Now, where the cost-benefit analysis is, is interesting to look at is in terms of what we're spending and what we're getting. So if we've already established that we're not getting much, we're not getting anything really in terms of effectiveness, why are we spending so much? Um, so this slide shows that crime is now at in Canada at its lowest point since 1972. It's been decreasing steadily from that point. Um, there's been a few blips here and there, but for the most part, it's very much on a downward trajectory. And during the last, the, uh, since 20, 2002 to 2012, criminal justice expenditures have been just skyrocketing, um, going up 66% at a time when the crime rate actually dropped 30%. So, so, you know, even if any of these other reasons for why mandatory minimum sentencing is bad, is a bad idea, um, are not compelling to someone, then if, if it's really just about dollars and cents, well, this, this again shows that um, we're spending a lot of money on something that's not working. And that money could be used for things that would work, like interventions at the front end that deal with people's poverty, deal with housing, deal with nutrition, deal with all sorts of things that are um, risk factors and indicators for future criminal behavior. And that's where, when we look to the system, uh, just for Bill C-10 alone, um, one, one aspect of it, which is the area of um, conditional, conditional sentences being, the availability of those being reduced, um, that, that one piece of legislation uh, was uh, slated to cost 150 million, upwards of 150 million dollars. 
Um, so, so that's $150 million that's not being used for any number of other proven interventions that would seriously go to a, a, addressing um, the crim, you know, criminal conduct and the potential that we have criminal conduct or future criminal conduct happening. Now, that's just dollars. Dollars is not even the most important part of the equation. Um, the cost to society is, is what I'm really concerned about, what I know Pivot is really concerned about, and very much a focus of the BCCLA's work as well. And the costs to society are immeasurable. These are the types of costs that Adrian mentioned, like what happens when you take children away from their primary caregivers? What does that mean to that child? What are the downstream costs, um, both in terms of that child's um, potential and development of that potential, but even if you are still concerned just with dollars and cents about well, what are going to be the costs to our system to work with that person down the road. Um, we know that children whose parents are incarcerated are more likely to be in the criminal justice system themselves, and we know that there are numerous consequences for their self-esteem, for their um, ability to kind of build a future and be an in, in, uh, involved member of society. So, so if we, we know these costs exist, um, we need to take them into account when we're making decisions about how we want to uh, make policy for our criminal justice system. So this is a photo that Charlotte found online that is a um, looking at the true cost of prisons project the Open Societies Foundation did and and it really highlights that there's a real human dimension, a real social dimension to this cost. Um, we use cost often to just talk about how much money is spent or how much money is saved but costs go well beyond that and it's very important for um, for lawmakers to understand what the consequences are going to be of actions that are taken now. Um, actions that influence the criminal justice system do not only affect how much it costs to run a trial in court or how much it costs to have somebody on parole. Those costs are only the costs that we can we can sort of tangibly appreciate in some way. The the true the true magnitude of the entire cost is really going to be borne by families and communities and individuals, and that cost is, is impossible to measure. Um, so as uh, I mentioned earlier, we've seen this exponential rise challenges to mandatory minimum sentencing, uh, or sorry, rather we've seen this exponential rise in mandatory minimum sentencing, which has resulted also in an increase in challenges at in court. And as Ian mentioned, Section 12 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms is where many of those challenges have um, been developed and where what section of the Charter has been applied to mandatory minimum sentences. Um, we've seen many novel approaches being taken by Council for individuals who are facing a mandatory minimum sentence. People have attempted to challenge not only their d duration of the sentence but how it was achieved or how it was arrived at as in what exercise of crown discretion was used to get to the place where a mandatory minimum will apply. We've also seen challenges to the disproportionate impact that a mandatory minimum will have on particular uh, uh, offenders, particularly Aboriginal offenders. Um, now what's happening is that the Supreme Court of Canada is going to have um, an opportunity to decide how the analysis of these cases should be done in two cases that are going to be heard in November of this year, uh, the Nur case and the Charles case. There are both cases which deal with mandatory minimum sentences for firearm offenses. They're cases out of Ontario. Um, they were heard along with four others in which the Ontario Court of Appeal struck down a mandatory minimum sentencing for certain types of firearm offenses as constituting cruel and unusual punishment under Section 12 of the Charter. Um, Section 12 is a high threshold. Uh, basically, you need to be able to show that the sentence is grossly disproportionate. And gross disproportionality has been viewed by courts 
as being such a high standard. It's sort of like shocking the conscience of the community or just being so out of um, out of proportion to, to really sort of just kind of knock your socks off, that sort of thing. But that's a very high threshold for anyone to meet. Um, but what you have in that in the period in the in the situation between what a proportionate sentence is and what a grossly disproportionate sentence is is a number of disproportionate sentences that, as we know from Adrian's presentation on sentencing principles, if proportionality is the fundamental principle of sentencing, how can we be happy knowing that we have a range of disproportionate sentences being handed out, sentences that don't reach the standard being so grossly disparate that a court is willing to strike down the sentencing provision, but yet are not the fit and appropriate sentence in all the circumstances and are not sentences that are going to um, give us confidence in our justice system. So um, Pivot and the BCCLA are seeking uh, intervener status in these two cases, and we would like to be there at the Supreme Court in November to um, give the court guidance about how we think uh, the analysis in these cases in mandatory minimum sentencing ought to proceed. This is an opportunity for the court to, um, to opine on an issue that they don't frequently get at their court. So we're really quite optimistic that we'll see some life breathed back into the Section 12 analysis. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then just kind of in concluding the presentation, um, asking what can we do now? Um, one option that has been discussed and mooted um, amongst lawyers anyways and, and certain policymakers is to find a way to return discretion in sentencing to judges. And earlier I talked about how Canada is one of or is the only jurisdiction that doesn't have a safety valve. Um, where judges could sort of approach the mandatory minimum as a presumptive minimum and then if in the circumstances before him or her see that that would not be the proportionate sanction for that individual offender in the circumstances of that offense, be able to sentence below the minimum um, so that we don't have an unjust outcome. That, that's uh, one option. Certainly the Canadian Bar Association um, who funded the BCCLA's report uh, has been very vocal in advocating for policy that policy and lawmakers to put in our criminal code some kind of exemption or safety valve type of clause. Um, we've also been standing um, for a long time asking the government to do its work in a way that is based in evidence. So, you know, where we're making decisions that affect so many people affect society at large, affect our perceptions about the country we live in and the society we live in. We need to be making these decisions based on evidence. And so we've also been calling along with Pivot, I know, in, in a number of different issues, not just on sentencing, but across the board um, for evidence-based policy reform, particularly in this area where the effects are so pernicious and the impact is so difficult to fully grasp at the front end. We don't want to be in a situation where the United States is right now after a decades long failed war on drugs trying to find ways to put discretion in sentencing back to judges. Um, so at a time when we're moving away from judicial discretion towards mandatory minimums, the front runner country who's basically known for mandatory minimum sentencing is moving away from doing that. So we really need to take heed of that lesson and understand what implications that had for the United States justice system and, and the manifest unfairness and unjustness that has resulted from that war on drugs. So it, it's, it's an interesting time um, for us, I think, given that the Supreme Court of Canada is going to be um, having an opportunity to look at this issue you know we are uh, parliament will be reconvening in the fall so 
we we are optimistic, cautiously optimistic, I suppose. I'm always <laughs> cautiously optimistic. You have to be. Um, but it, it, you know, we hope that this work will some will come to feed into the thinking on these issues going forward. And for more information, um, just pop up a slide here that uh, shows you the report the BCCLA just released this past Monday, and then Pivot's report, which was released in 2013. Um, I think together they are just absolutely awesome. <laughs> They're awesome individually too, but together even more awesome. So I think now um, that sort of concludes a formal presentation and we'll open it up for questions. And there should be um, a little happy smiley face button click down on that uh, drop down box with a little hand that's raised. Um, so feel free to either speak your question out if you've got a microphone on your on your computer um, or type it out and we'll have Charlotte who's been helping us put this webinar together um, do the moderating and then we'll have uh, hopefully a really great discussion on um, mandatory minimum sentencing. Thank you. So the question and answer box, it has, uh, your desktop has a number of boxes on it, and you'll see the video pictures on the left-hand corner, and just under that there's a box that says attendee list, and underneath that on the right there's a happy face, and you can click on that to raise your hand. You could also type your message into the chat box, which is just below that whole section, and we'll do our best to answer your questions. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Our first question is coming in. We're just waiting for it to pop up. So the first question, it says, I have a question to get us started. What impact might the NER case have on the broader issue of mandatory minimum sentencing? Um, I'll take this one. Um, we're really hoping, because the NER and Charles cases are the first time that the Supreme Court of Canada will have considered these new amendments to the criminal code that came through in 2012 that imposed a suite of mandatory minimums. But they're also really going to clear up an unclear area of law, which is how to interpret Section 12 of the Charter. So while Nur and Charles are about gun charges, which um, limited at impact to other gun cases, what the Supreme Court of Canada says about Section 12 and how it works is going to be really important for everybody else who's setting up to make challenges to the other mandatory minimum sentences, particularly for uh, charges and under the Controlled Drug and Substances Act, which is all of Canada's drug crimes. And um, some of the new proposed legislation on the books brings in a whole bunch of new mandatory minimums. We're going to know exactly what Section 12 means, and I'm quite hopeful about it. Did you have something to add? Sure. Um, uh, yeah, so this, so the Supreme Court of Canada has not had many opportunities to provide guidance on how mandatory minimum sentences ought to be 
looked at under the charter. So there's there haven't been a ton of cases. The most recent one was a case back in 2008, which was really not even really about mandatory minimums. It was more about remedies. Um, it was a case called Ferguson. And what judges had been doing prior to Ferguson, sort of get around the situation that we've described where, you know, you you want some kind of safety valve. You want something where you have um, some ability to look at all the circumstances and determine if there is a sentence that is more appropriate than what is the minimum. And judges were basically um, finding, uh, giving individuals constitutional exemptions. Mm -hmm. So what a constitutional exemption is, it means that what the judge was saying was the application of the law to you, you person in front of me on this case, is unconstitutional. So that law that that will affect you unconstitutionally, we will not apply it to you. What the Supreme Court of Canada said in this Ferguson case is that it has to be that if, if it's unconstitutional, it's unconstitutional. It's not just that it's unconstitutional for Raji Mangit because she happened to bring her case to court um, and that that law still stands on the books. So what that did was in some way what I think judges were doing with those exemptions was that was kind of their way of trying to get back some um, discretion where they were dealing with a situation that wouldn't make, um, wouldn't be proportionate for them to um, give the individual the mandatory minimum, um, but yet they were uncomfortable about striking it down entirely. So this, this was kind of like a halfway house. But now that that's not available, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see since this Nur and Charles case is the, is the next opportunity for the Supreme Court to give us some guidance on how the Section 12 analysis should be. What I'm interested in seeing is whether, because in that 2012 case that Adrian mentioned, Ippoli, um, Justice LaBelle, one of the judges on the Supreme Court, gave us a very robust view of what proportionality in sentencing means. So how will the court reconcile that with mandatory minimum sentencing that it's going to have to deal with in the Nur and Charles cases? It'll be interesting to see how they deal with that sort of very robust constitutional idea of, I mean, Justice Bell came out and said almost you know, it's, he said this is a, a pretty much a principle of fundamental justice. So if it's a principle of fundamental justice to have proportionality in sentencing, how can we live with sentences that are disproportionate? Um, so it, it's it's going to be it's going to be interesting, I think, to see how that um, how that is uh, addressed by the Supreme Court. So that will have an impact on all the mandatory minimum challenges coming along down the line. Um, regardless of what subject matter they deal with. And if I could just make a follow-up point, Ferguson says, which is that if it's if a sentence is unconstitutional for one person, we strike it down and it's not on the books anymore, rather than exempting that one person. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense in light of what we've just learned about wording of Section 12. Because if you'll recall that slide, it says everyone will be free from cruel and unusual punishment, not just people who have enough resources to argue their case to the Supreme Court of Canada, or people whose uh, fence has a particularly compassionate fact pattern. Mm -hmm. And um, when we, should we get leave to intervene in there, we intend to tell the court uh, that a really broad reading of sections necessary in order to protect everyone. We're just going to give it another minute or so for people to be brave and uh, speak up with their question. Otherwise, we'll let you get on with your day. So we'll just give it a second. 
Um, I'm just looking over my shoulder and I see that Adrian has written Lloyd in large writing on her piece of paper. So while we're waiting for questions, um, maybe it is a good idea for us to tell you a little bit about another case that is the first challenge to the mandatory minimum sentences for drug offenses in the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. This is a case that from BC, um, a provincial court judge found that the mandatory one year minimum sentence was unconstitutional. Uh, the case went on up to the BC Court of Appeal where the court decided it without uh, recourse to the constitutional issues. They did not hear the constitutional arguments, which were the Section 12 arguments about uh, mand the mandatory minimum being cruel and unusual. Um, Mr. Lloyd is someone whom Pivot would work with in their work. He's an individual on the downtown east side of Vancouver who um, is, is dealing with uh, drug addiction and was found uh, to be trafficking in sub controlled substances. And what I think is really important to understand and that I think a lot of people don't understand is the definition of trafficking is very broad. It's not what you're thinking of some sort of cartel uh, bringing you know, boatloads of drugs over. Um, trafficking is, is sharing. Trafficking is offering. Uh, trafficking is a very broad um, offense. And so individuals who may seek merely to share something with a, uh, with a friend or a spouse or someone will be caught under that offense. And so um, we know that counsel for Mr. Lloyd has, um, is seeking to have his case heard at the Supreme Court of Canada also. So we will be keeping an eye out, and I know Pivot and the BCCLA are very much interested in, in that case as well. We have a we question have a from question. Kayla. And when the Nehran Charles case reaches the Supreme Court of Canada, will the Supreme Court also address how mandatory minimums can be reconciled with Section 718.1 of the Criminal Code? Uh, that's the uh, sentencing provision we saw about proportionality. Um, that is a really good question, and the, uh, I guess, fully too cute by half answer is, I sure hope so. Um, I know that it, submissions in the Nuren Charles case will be restricted to how Section 12 of the Charter should be interpreted, but I find it difficult to imagine how the Supreme Court could answer that question without considering proportionality. Um, it's interesting because neither Mr. Nur or Mr. Charles are Aboriginal offenders, mm -hmm. and uh, Ippoli won't seem as intuitively applicable, but uh, it's a really recent decision of this court, which has to be top of mind for them when they consider the issue. Mm -hmm. I, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I, I think that given how forcefully they address the issue, just a few years ago, um, it's certainly going to be, you know, brought to their attention by, I'm imagining, many of the groups that are going to uh, seek intervener status. I know the BC Civil Liberties Association is very interested in um, that issue about how the, how the court will reconcile these um, contradictory and inconsistent um, strains in our criminal code. Carmen also has a question here. It is that um, Canada is one of the few only jurisdictions where judges don't have discretion to vary a mandatory minimum sentence. Will the Supreme Court be addressing in Nur and Charles the issue of whether a safety valve is required and what the safety valve should look like? Um, I suspect that they will probably not be talking specifically about safety valves. Um, what, what the Supreme Court has said time and time again is they've, uh, they've deferred to Parliament as the lawmaking power in terms of whether manda mandatory minimums are sort of not per se unconstitutional. That's what the court has said many times over um, since it's basically since the beginning of its analysis of mandatory minimum sentencing. And so I would be surprised if they sort of went into the weeds to talk about what um, 
what a safety valve would look like. I mean, perhaps they might allude to practice in other jurisdictions or counsel may put that before them. I'm just given um, the trend in how they've spoken kind of generally about Parliament's lawmaking power, um, I, I don't expect them to really get down into talking too, uh, too specifically about safety valves. I mean, we're, we're talking about what the court's going to do, which is the, the legal side of it. But essentially, I mean, the, that issue, I think, can only be dealt with in the political arena. Mm -hmm. And we need to have, um, we need to have uh, members of parliament and policymakers really pushing for this if it's ever going to come. Um, you know, the chances of 50 plus mandatory minimum offenses being being repealed, uh, not so much. The chances of getting something in there that could minimize the damage of mandatory minimum sentences, I think is a more, um, is, is perhaps a more likely event. Though certainly the government right now has not made any indication that they're interested in doing that. But um, it, it seems like given that that's been done elsewhere and is very much the norm where mandatory minimums apply, it, it's, quite, it's quite bizarre to me that that isn't more seriously being pursued. There's also a consideration about what the court is. being asked. Um, just testing to see if people can still hear me. Um, it sounds like Adrian's audio. Oh, it's back. Great. I'll talk over here. Okay. Um, so uh, what uh, what's required is a guilty plea, which means that people uh, have to choose between um, the right to be presumed innocent and the right to have the Crown prove all the elements of the case against them. Uh, instead of their constitutional right to be free from cruel and unusual punishment. And uh, at Pivot, we say it, it's not a menu. The Charter is not a menu of rights that you could pick. It uh, actually has important repercussions, and you should be entitled to all of those protections. Uh, so I certainly, uh, I have lots of time for Mr. Lloyd's defense attorney, Mr. Lloyd's argument that the availability of drug treatment court doesn't answer the problem of the unconstitutionality Mm -hmm. of the mandatory minimum. And I think I'd go a step farther, uh, I think, than some commentators have, and say that uh, tinkering with laws which on the face are unconstitutional is not the solution. Mm -hmm. They need to be uh, struck from the books. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, going to happen either because lawmakers become enlightened or because the court tells Parliament that it has to. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see um, in terms of what kind of signaling the court gives to Parliament. Uh, we've seen over just the last few um, days of reading the news about a number of different 
judges who have um, struck down various aspects of some of the bills like the Truth in Sentencing Act, other, other bills that the government had recently enacted that are um, take sort of a stronger, more primitive stance on crime. And it's the, you know, in terms of how the court has this conversation with Parliament about whether there should be a safety valve or what, or, or, or what, um, that, that is sort of perhaps the most um, compelling speech that we'll see is striking down more and more of these types of uh, laws and forcing Parliament to, to do the hard work that they didn't do the first time around, basically. Okay, I think that's it for us. We're, we've taken up your lunch hour. Thank you for joining us um, for our webinar. And it's been recorded and we'll post tomorrow. Ooh. Sure. And, oh. and we're told the webinar has been recorded. So if you've got some friends or colleagues who weren't able to join us today, please spread the word that it will be available on the BCCLA's website at bccla.org. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, look forward to chatting with you again. OCLE credit.